All right, praise the Lord and greetings in Jesus' name. Welcome to Christian Life Broadcast, a ministry of Christian Life Center right here in beautiful Palm Coast, Florida, 5200 Beltair Parkway. We're so excited that you have decided to join us today, and we pray that this podcast is a blessing to you. And we are so excited to uh, bring this broadcast to you. We have a special guest today. Uh, Evangelist Caleb Herring has been preaching for us since New Year's Eve, and my Lord have mercy, we have had a time in the Holy Ghost. The services have been, the services have been the kind of services that you never forget. And um, last night was a Tuesday night. It's a, a night that we normally don't have church, but the power of God flowed in such a way that the whole city feels different. The atmosphere feels different. And we are, we are just so privileged and thankful to have this man of God with us. And uh, we're going to ask him as many questions as we can. And I know it'll be a blessing to you. Brother Caleb Herring, welcome to Christian Live Broadcast. Thank you for coming on. It's a delight to have you, man. Well, I'm glad to be a part. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. So obviously you, um, you are uh, preaching all over the place. God's using you in a special way. Um, it's not just something that is, has just begun. You've been doing it for, how many years have you been? Uh, going on eight years. And that's full-time? Full-time. Eight years. Yes, sir. And I, wanna, I want to, I feel like sort of our mission, my mission today is to talk about the process behind the preacher. There's no doubt when you speak the anointing flows the power of god is there there's miracles signs and wonders uh, there's already been miracles in in the in the few services that you've been here for this weekend um but i would like to um ask you about your your past your history kind of the process that god brought you through leading you to this point that you are today sure and so i think the first thing would be to um talk about your you know, where are you from? You're, were you born into Pentecost? Were you converted by somebody? How, how, did, how did you get into Pentecost? So I was raised in Pentecost uh, there at my home church in Bogalusa, uh, dedicated as a baby. And my parents raised my sister and I in truth. And uh, there are a lot of things that my, both of my parents instilled in me at a very young age concerning truth and uh, living for God. And when I was 12 years old, my parents went through a divorce. And there was a period of time where we were not in church. I was not in church. Uh, Very backslid in my spirit. I would visit occasionally. uh, But when I say occasionally, it it was a rarity. Um, Just totally lost from about 12 to 15 years old. How How did you visit? Did they bring you? Uh, my mother would, would bring me occasionally. Drop you off? Uh, she would come too. We, we would both go. Uh, but again, it was, it was a rarity. Uh, and I, if she were here, she'd be honest and tell you, we were, we were both lost, backslid in our spirits, even though we were there presently uh, or physically on an occasion. How old were you when you got the Holy Ghost? Uh, I was seven years old, baptized in Jesus' name. I got the Holy Ghost uh, in kids' church on a Wednesday night seven years old. And so, uh, and then from 12 to 15, I was again backslid, lost, playing high school sports. Um, And then I was in a car accident and I was telling you a little bit about this on the way over here. I was in a car accident when I was 15 years old, July 9th, 2009, uh, driving illegally, didn't have a permit, didn't have a license. I was on my way home from basketball practice and lost control of the vehicle, overcorrected, flipped several times going down the highway. And when the vehicle stopped flipping, it was upside down, landed on its roof. And I went from my seatbelt buckled in the driver's seat to when the wreck was over, I was in the back seat. And there was this little small gap in the window of the back seat that I was able to crawl out of 
And when I crawled out, I looked down and my hand was gashed open. Uh, You could see the tendon of my hand. It had been snapped and it was pushed all the way back up into my wrist. Uh, My hand was just covered in blood. I had no functionality in, in my thumb or anything. And it was my shooting hand, oddly enough, but God knows what he's doing. And so it's, it really is a miracle uh, because when we looked at the wreckage, the photos after, when they flipped the vehicle back over upright, where I was sitting in the driver's seat, the roof had completely crushed in down to the seat. And so literally the hand of God took me and unbuckled my seatbelt in the driver's seat and put me in the back seat and left me just a small window to crawl out of. And I really believe that that was a parallel in the spirit for where my life was. God was giving me a window of grace. And and I crawled out of that, that window. And I, you know, prior to that wreck, the Lord was, was dealing with me and he was softening my heart toward him. You were 15 when that wreck I was, happened? I was 15 when that happened. Uh, but prior to that wreck, there was several months where the Lord was just dealing with me the way that my my mom and dad had raised me. Um, I couldn't get away from that. You know, we talked about the scripture that says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That is so true because there were, there were memories that I had from a child and things that my parents had taught me from, you know, six, seven, eight years old that Thank I, you, Jesus. even all of those years later through my backslidden state at 15 years old, I, I never could get away from it. God just would not leave me alone. And um, did that come in the form of feelings? Feelings, feelings, and um, conviction. The conviction is real. And so uh, that was July 9th of 2009. And the process, what happened was because I had to have surgery on my hand. I uh, had to wear a cast for three months, which means I couldn't play ball for three months, which means uh, I couldn't go to uh, summer league, play ball with the team. I couldn't practice. And so organically, that disconnected me from this crowd, and it started pushing me toward the right crowd. And uh, I started going back to youth services at my home church and started getting more involved there at uh, my home church that was your mom taking you at that point? She was. She was. And my, my mother and I and my sister started going back to church in that time. And uh, my pastor, just Travis Houston, uh, he had only been elected as pastor at that time for six months. And so uh, we started going back to church six months after he became the pastor. And uh, so that wreck happened on July 9th of 2009. I and in that time frame, I went to my pastor and I said, I feel the call to preach. Uh, I'm giving up high school basketball. I'm Same year, 15 years old? Same year, 15 years old. So I, I preached. So that wreck was July 9th. I preached my first message on October the 19th, 2009. So when God did a radical shift in me, it was literally three months of being from being totally backslid having a car accident to being called to preach, preaching my first message. What did the <clears throat> what did the radical shift look like? Were, were you praying, fasting? Were you what were you doing? So I had this this desire out of nowhere to just be at church. And when I say at church, I don't mean in a church service. I mean to just be on that campus and be in that sanctuary and in that prayer room. And so all I knew, I didn't know anything about preaching. I didn't know how to craft a message. I didn't know how to study my Bible. Uh, but my mom took me to Books a Million one day. I'll never forget it. It was right after we started going to church and we went to a neighboring city. There's not much in Bogalusa. So if you want to go to like a chain restaurant like Chili's or something, you go to Covington, which is about a 25, 30 minute drive. So after church, me and my mom and my sister, we go to Covington and we eat and we go to Books A Million and she buys me a little pocket Bible and she buys me a, uh, 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 
what is it called? A um, the the Greek and the Hebrew lexicon. Uh, she bought me a lexicon. Yeah, and uh, a Strong's concordance. That's what I was looking for. She brought me a Strong's concordance, and I had to learn how to find the Greek and the Hebrew and and flip through that and. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of stumbled my way through it, and then uh, I just, I would just go up to the church, and I would just pray. And I didn't know how to pray. I would just scream. I would just say Jesus. I would just. I would cry. And again, I just. I just stumbled my way through it. And I'll tell you what's interesting is I started doing that, and then after I preached my first message, there was a. Uh, a service at my home church and there was a, a neighboring pastor and his wife that were in the church service. And and this is the first time I realized that prayer works. If you want the anointing on your life, this is when I realized prayer works. I, uh, I got up to do, I think it was the offering and the announcements. And I just took a minute and I just exhorted. And then I did the offering and the announcements and I went and sat down and I was, I was young, man. I was a teenager, but I'd been in a prayer closet. And I remember in the after-service meal, that pastor's wife that was a guest in the service, she came to me and she said, she said, wow. She said, you are so young, but when you were talking, I could just feel the anointing on your life. And I realized I, prayer really does work. And it was in that moment that I said, whatever I'm doing now, I got to keep doing it. And, and that was kind of how my, my walk with God started. And then so, uh, again, I, I gave up high school sports. I went to my pastor. I said, I'm done. I want to go back to the, the wreck. Okay. And, you know, you're, in hindsight, you're seeing the hand of God. Did you, did you recognize the hand of God in that moment? that God was trying to disconnect you from one world and plug you into another? I did. I did. Because I, I knew I knew what my parents had, had put in me as a kid, and I knew the experiences that I... I've always been uh, very, very tender, and there are giftings that I've had since I was a kid. You know, I would, I would wake up in the middle of the night, and things would be in my room. And, you know, as a kid, I would, I would walk into a room... And I would, I would just know stuff, and I wouldn't know how I knew it. Did you have anyone that you could talk to about that stuff? I, just, I, didn't, I didn't understand. I just, it was so clear to me. I thought everyone knew what I knew. I thought everyone picked up on what I was sensing or what I knew about this person or that person or what I felt in the room. And it wasn't until years later. You know, those giftings never left. And it wasn't until years later uh, that God started placing men in my life that recognized that gifting and that office and helped me, uh, as I explained to you the other night, kind of helped me wear the garment better and uh, understand what I was and what those giftings were. Uh, and so I said that to answer your question that, yes, sir, when I was even then, I, I knew that it was God pulling on me and allowing me to feel things to bring me back to him. What was your family's reaction when you begin to lock in at the church? Well, there was a, um, th there was a little bit of, of resistance because um, I was the first preacher in my family. There's nobody else in my, in, my, in my family that has ever done what I've done, to my knowledge. Did you know, so during that time, did you know you were called to preach? Like when you were started going to the church and had that desire to be at the church all the time? Did you know it was associated with the call to preach? So the Lord was working on me uh, a little before the wreck, and then it intensified after the wreck. Gotcha. And then there was, I mean, it. if I didn't know at the time of the wreck, uh, again, that's been 16 years ago or, or more, um, if I didn't know at the time of the wreck, um, it it was shortly thereafter that I knew I was called to preach. Because again, it was such a quick work, July to October, that's three months. And so it was somewhere in that time frame that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm called to preach and I can't get away from it. And you were the first preacher in your family? In my, in my family. And so there was a little resistance. You know, my dad really wanted me to go to college and get a secular education because he had seen preachers fail. 
and, and not have anything to fall back on. But I have an obsessive personality. I have a, a, a very radical personality. And so just as I threw myself into high school sports, I threw myself into the call of God. And there was no plan B. To this day, there's no plan B. It's, it's do or die for me. It's sink or swim. And so I just, I went all in and pursued the call of God. And so like even so much to the point that my senior year, I went to my counselor and I said, I'm going to do the bare minimum to graduate. I don't recommend that for everybody. But for me, I just, I just knew that I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to pursue a secular degree when I graduate. I'm going all in. And I'm pursuing the call of God with everything in me. And this is what I'm going to do. And there is no other option. Do you think, do you, think you could have done both? High school sports and continued doing that while going to church, while being dedicated, but also pursue ministry? 100% unequivocally no. Because again, I am such a... a an obsessive personality. Or, or let, me, let me say it like this. I maybe could have, but it would have delayed me. The, the acceleration would have been slower. I would not be where I am today had I continued to play high school ball and pursue the call of God because it wouldn't be uncommon to have practice. And I don't know if every high school is like this, but it wouldn't be uncommon for us to have practice on a Sunday night or on a Wednesday night and then a game on Friday. Uh, and then when you factor in summer league, I mean, we're playing high school ball all during youth camps, traveling during the summer and, and practicing and things of that nature. And so when God called me to preach, I didn't want to miss a Sunday night. I didn't, I can't even sing, but I was in the choir. I just wanted to be involved in some way. <laughs> and so I didn't want to miss prayer meeting on Tuesday night. I didn't want to miss choir practice. I didn't want to miss midweek Bible study. I didn't want to miss a youth rally on Friday. I wanted to be at every youth camp I could be at. And so for me, I could not live in both worlds. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't entertain the atmosphere of worldly sports and the atmosphere of of the presence of God at the same time. And so that's why. Do you think that's a common principle or is it just something for you? Uh, well, I think it's both. I think it's a common principle and it was something for me. You know, uh, those locker rooms haven't gotten any cleaner. And I'm not talking about sanitary. I'm talking about spiritually. If anything, they've probably gotten even more vile since I was in high school. And so if there's a, a young man that thinks he can live in both worlds, and truly have the anointing that shifts the atmosphere and walk into a city and be recognized by the spirit world, it's probably not going to happen, not until that's laid on the altar. And I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. Yes, my, my favorite author, he's an essayist from the early 1800s. He said, every man has an atmosphere that affects every other. What he was saying was, is every man has one dominant atmosphere that sets the temperature for every other atmosphere in his life. Hmm. And so for me, if I would have continued to play high school sports, the atmosphere of sports would have affected the atmosphere of my prayer closet. My Lord, bro. Rather than the atmosphere of my prayer closet affecting the atmosphere of sports. And so in order to really live in this atmosphere. I had to disconnect from this atmosphere. And that's just, it's just not worth it to me. It's, again, there's some people that maybe could live in both worlds, but they're not, no matter how you slice it, they're not gonna have that, that true apostolic ministry that, that you and I are after. It's just, it's not gonna happen. When did your when did your pastor begin to what was your relationship with your pastor once you came back and started locking back in and how did that relationship develop? So when I mentioned my parents divorcing, um, there was a, a period of time where my relationship with my father um, 
was pretty much non-existent. It, it was virtually non-existent. And so I went through, uh, I mean, from 12 to 15, I went through very formative years as a young man where you really need a father. I mean, those are some of the most pivotal years uh, of a young man's life. And my relationship with my father, it was, it was so damaged at the time that it was, it was essentially non-existent. And I do want to say years later, God has really mended and I have a, I have a great relationship uh, with my father today and the Lord has really worked a miracle. And I, I even have early memories of my father. I mean, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and my dad would be knelt down by my bed at six, seven, eight years old and I'd wake up with oil on my head the next morning. And uh, my parents had a walk-in closet at the time and uh, he had a, a little bench in there and his clothes would be folded up on that bench. And I can remember as a kid, uh, he, would, he would take me into that prayer closet and I, I would fall asleep listening to my dad pray in that prayer closet. Just I'd lay on that bench on top of those folded clothes and I'd be sound asleep while he prayed. And, and even my mother, you know, I would, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to walk down the hallway and see the flicker of a, a candle under her door and hear my mother in there weeping and, and praying and talking to God as, a, as just a kid. And, and so even though we went through several years uh, later on after that where our relationship was very fragmented and, again, basically non-existent, uh, there were things that he... Put, so I, I, I want to give them due honor is what I'm saying. Yes, sir. And so um, at that time when God called me to preach again at 15 years old, I was starving for a, a father figure to just pay me a little attention. And my pastor became that. And so he, he took me in and literally he taught me how to shave. He taught me how to tie a tie, taught me how to change a tire, how to hold a weed eater. Um, he, he taught me uh, how, to, how to craft a sermon, how to pray. He taught me how to basically just how to be a man and to just man up and get it done. He, he helped me with that grit. He put that grit in me, you know, to just, just handle business and, and take care of stuff. And so what happened was, is when I came to him and I told him I was called to preach, uh, he taught us, he said, you know, you have the heart of a servant when someone treats you like one. And so starting off there, this is going to sound harsh, but there was no regard for my feelings when I, when I told him I was called to preach, he said, okay, well, I guess you'll preach. And that was his way of saying, if you're really called, nothing's going to stop you. You're, you're going to preach. In other words, I'm about to put you through it, and we're going to see how bad you want it. Let me ask you something about your proximity to him. So when you say he took you in, <clears throat> are you spending time with him a lot during the day? Absolutely. So it, it started out, uh, so this was my... Uh, it started my sophomore year of high school. Um, I, uh, I started going up to the church every holiday, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break. Whatever holiday we didn't have school, I'd be at the church working. And uh, I would do that after school. I would come in after school and work late into the night. Um, and then I would come in full time during the summer and work you know, 40 hour work weeks during the summer for him, not on staff officially for the church, for him. I was his, his assistant. And whatever, was it a job with pay and, and not initially, but it, it morphed into that. So you were doing it for just because you wanted to be close to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it, it started off, you know, what did uh, that work look like? Oh man. Um, tell me about it. <laughs> so I would wash both him and his wife's vehicle once a week. Uh, she had a, a, a suburban Denali uh, or a Yukon Denali, a, the, you know, the big, long. Right, you know, like a, washing. Yeah. And uh, he had a 2008 Toyota Tundra. And so those are not small vehicles. And so I washed those once a once week. Once a week. Did you do it on a particular day or just whenever? Uh, usually on Mondays, so it would be clean for the, the rest of the week. 
Um, and then, um, I mean, I would clean both of our buildings. My home church seats about 600 people. Uh, so I would clean both of our buildings, the sanctuary, office areas, all of that, foyer, uh, bathrooms. Um, Did would, he have a cleaning crew in addition to you? Was there a, he, like a... He did before me. And so then, you took over the cleaning then, crew and job. And then when I got there and he realized he could get the same work for free, I started doing it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would mow his yard, take care of his flower bed, plant trees. If something broke, you know, whether it's a hole in the sheetrock or plumbing that's broke or uh, faded paint. Or, so this is full-time this, servanthood. This is, this is yeah, full-time. I, I remember one time I was, uh, you know, and there, there may be, you know, just because I had a time that I'd show up and leave doesn't mean I was off. I went seven years. This is not exaggeration. I went seven years and never took a nap with my phone on silent because at any time he could call me and I would, I would be there to do whatever he needed. I was on call 24 seven for him. Um, you know, I could, and, and he would test my spirit. He would, te- he would do things purposely to test my spirit. I remember I was off work and I was on the golf course there at the, at the local golf course in Bogalusa. And I was on like whole, it's like seven. How were you doing? I was, I was not doing the best, but I was doing well enough to want to keep playing that day. And so I got a text and he said, I don't have any coffee for tomorrow. Run, run to the store before they close and, and get me some. He lives 30 seconds from the store. And I could have said, you know, Pastor, I'm playing golf. You live right down the road. Uh, you know, I don't want to waste this, this round of golf. Uh, but I didn't. Instead, I left the golf course. Was there, a, was there an internal sort of struggle for you with that? Absolutely, as there would be with anybody. But that was my, my Leah years. That's what I called my Leah mm. years. I was, I was working for something that I, I knew I wanted, and I knew in the end it would pay off. And so I left the golf course, and I went to the dollar store, and I got him his, uh, he, at the time, he liked uh, Pike Place. Starbucks K cups, and that's what he drank uh, every morning. And so I went and got him a box and brought it to his house. Knocked on the door, and he came to the door, grabbed them. He didn't say come in for dinner. My wife cooked. He said, "All right, see you in the morning." Shut the door. Whew. And I just said, "Yes, sir." And 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 he wasn't doing it out of spite. He was just testing my spirit. And. You know, there were little tests like that throughout those seven years. Uh, And you talked about proximity. There's power in proximity because some things are taught, other things are caught. And it's a principle that we see in Scripture with Elijah and Elisha. And, you know, when it comes to to mentorship and to pouring into a young man, you never read, uh, okay, so Elijah gave the initial invitation, but... Elijah didn't stop and try to talk Elisha into following him. He brushed him with the mantle and kept going. And Elisha had to make a decision. Am I going to stay here or am I going to get into proximity to the man of God? And he burned the plow and killed the ox and he followed Elijah. And there were several opportunities where Elisha could have separated himself from the man of God. They went to, they went to Bethel. They went to Jericho. They went to... Uh, these different places, and Elijah gave him the opportunity. He said, "He said, wait here." And Elisha said, "Nevertheless, I will not leave thee, even though you're giving me the option to quit, even though you're giving me the option to separate myself from you. I want what you've got, and the only way to get that is to be in proximity to you. Those fifty sons of the prophets who feel like they're entitled to it because of their pedigree." They're going to stay on the other side of the river. But I'm just the son of a farmer. I don't come from a lineage of prophets. I've got to pay a price for this, and I'm willing to pay whatever price it is. I'm going to stay close to you, Elijah. And so when they come to, to Jordan, he says, what do you want from me? And he says, you know, we, we preach, he said, I want a double portion of your anointing. He didn't say that. 
He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Because again, there are some things that are taught, but there are other things that are caught. And he had to catch the spirit of the man of God. And so when the chariot comes and Elijah is carried away, he steps into that prophetic vein that the last generation operated in. And so <clears throat> there, were, there were opportunities, you know, for me, to, for me to walk away to get a bad spirit and quit. But I knew when those 50 sons of the prophets are on the other side of the river, I got, I got to stay close. Because there were other young preachers that said they were called and they, they just couldn't hack it. They just couldn't handle the process. They didn't, they didn't want to weed eat the ditch. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to mow the yard. They didn't want to wash the vehicle. They didn't want to pick up the trash. They didn't want to do any of that. They didn't want to vacuum the 600-seat sanctuary. They didn't want to scrub the toilets. They didn't want to do any of that. You scrubbed toilets? I did. So over the course of, of seven years before I ever preached my first revival, I scrubbed 7,000 toilets. And that's, that's a calculated, that's not an exaggeration, 7,000 toilets before I ever preached my first revival. And my pastor told me many, many times, he said, endure the process. Just endure the process. When I didn't want to do it, when I didn't want to, you know, whatever the task at hand was, when I, when I was weary, wondering, is this ever going to pay off? He would just, he would tell me, endure the process. And, and one day it'll all make sense. And so, you know, there's a, a story that I like to tell just emphasizing the power of proximity. Um, this, I'd been working for him for a few years at this point. And our district campgrounds is about a four hour drive from Bogalusa. And his kids were toddlers at the time, so he took his kids to kids' camp. They had a cabin on the campgrounds. It's a, it was a two-story cabin. And upstairs, there was a leak in the toilet, and the toilet wasn't working. And so it's like... At the campgrounds. At, at the campgrounds. And so I'm back in Bogalusa taking care of the home front while they're at kids' camp. And I get a text, and it's like midnight. And he says, there's a leak in the toilet upstairs. Get the tool bag and head up this way tomorrow. I need you to help me fix this toilet. So I wake up first thing. I get on the road by about 8 o'clock, grab the tool bag. And I drive four hours. And when I get there, I walk into his cabin. And he says, oh, so-and-so stop by and help me fix the toilet. It's, it's already done. And then he looked at me, and, and it was at that moment I could have got an attitude and said, you could have told me that instead of letting me drive four hours one way to come and help you fix this toilet. But I didn't because, again, there's power in proximity. So what he said, he said, was fix us a pot of coffee. And so I made us some coffee, and for, for several hours, he and I just sat in his cabin, and we just drank coffee. And we talked about preaching. We talked about the word. We talked about sermon ideas. We talked about just, just ministry. And for hours, he poured into me. Had I gotten the wrong spirit and, and left with a bad attitude and lashed out, I would have missed a moment of impartation with my Elijah. And there are things in that moment that I would not have caught had I separated myself when I had the opportunity. That's, man, that's a powerful statement because it seems like in that process, you have a legitimate reason. You have a legitimate excuse of why you could have a response that'll call separation. And um, it's, it's rejecting those legitimate reasons yeah. to stay in proximity. That's the rare thing. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, and I teach young minister sessions on this, but there's a, uh, I call it the progression of sonship. And so you asked about my, my relationship with him. When I was 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, the, the, the first phase of sonship is imitation. Jesus said, be ye followers of me. That word follower there is imitators. Be ye imitators of me. When you study Paul's writings about uh, adoption, 
the candidate for adoption would follow the one adopting him and imitate him. And, and historically, the, the Roman process of adoption teaches that the adoptee would perpetuate the name and the nature of the father even greater than the son that is a genetic son because the candidate for adoption follows him so closely. He imitates him. He acts like him. He does what he does. He says what he says. And so I dress like him. I, I tied my tie like him. I, I shined my shoes like him. I did everything like him. I imitated him. And then in imitating him, you start catching things. And so when you look at when Elijah was carried away, Elisha said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. Well, when Elisha was on his deathbed, the king said to Elisha, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. There was something about Elisha that reminded that king about Elijah. It's because he imitated him and he took on his nature and he began to act like him. And then when you imitate, it leads to the second part of sonship, which is impartation. Imitation leads to impartation. As Elisha was imitating Elijah, it led to a moment of impartation where they were standing at the bank of that river and that mantle fell and a double portion of his spirit was imparted to Elisha. And then you get into the final phase, which is individuality. You've imitated him. You've been imparted to by him. Now you begin to kind of find out who you are and you begin to do things uh, that are, are particular only to you. And when you look at the life of Elisha after Elijah was carried away, you see where Elisha did some of the same miracles Elijah did. But there would always be a little, a little difference and a little tweaking to the way that Elisha did it. It's because he stepped into that realm of individuality. And so even though it was the same spirit, the same anointing, and the same prophetic vein, Elijah was more a call fire down from heaven, kill everything, burn up everything, destroy the prophets of Baal, go after Jezebel, whereas Elisha was more of an encouraging and uplifting and miracle signs and wonders. And so that was him stepping into the realm of individuality. And so that's the way that it worked for me. I imitated him. And then, you know, for years, I would go to the campgrounds for a district conference or for youth camp or um, camp meeting. And and I didn't even have a name. Nope. I, the majority of the people didn't even know my name. It was, oh, yeah, that's Houston's boy. That's that's Houston's boy. He's He's helping Houston. He's serving Houston. That's Houston's boy. And for years, that's, that's all I was known by, is Houston's boy. Before I ever preached a revival, before it was ever evangelist this or whatever, or brother whatever, it's Houston's boy. And it was the greatest honor of my life. I'm not, I'm not talking down on that at all. It was the greatest honor of my life, Houston's boy. And uh, I, I remember, you know, there comes a point where servanthood transitions into the supernatural. Because as I was serving him and working for him, I had watched him pray countless people through to the Holy Ghost. And I had learned what to say and what to do and how to go about it. Certain mannerisms to do and not to do. And, uh, you know, certain etiquette if you're praying for a man, if you're praying for a woman, uh, different things like that. I'd watched him do it several times. He never looked at me and said, this is how you do it. But because I was close to him in those altar calls, I'd be standing there holding his sweat towel and he'd reach back and grab it and wipe his head and hand it back to me. Or I'd stay close to him and he'd point and need water and I'd go get his water and he'd take a sip of water or, or something like that. I was just there in case he needed something. And so uh, we were standing on the platform one day and there's this, this couple and um, they're, they're sitting there and, or they're standing there and the worship service is going Man, the power of God is moving. And both of them, the man and the woman, this couple, they're just sobbing. 
I don't know that they'd ever been in a Pentecostal church service. They're just weeping. They don't know what they're feeling. And he looks at me and he says, do you not see those guests crying, needing the Holy Ghost? And I said, yes, sir. He said, go pray them both through or you're fired. And he, I've never met Brother Travis Houston, but I love him. He's awesome. He's my hero. <laughs> and, and he pray was, him through or you're fired. He was serious. Pray them through or you're fired. My goodness. And so, yes, sir. And this was the first time that servanthood had ever shifted into the supernatural. And where I stepped into what he had imparted to me, I stepped into what I'd caught from him and didn't even know it. And I went to him and I did exactly what he did, praying people through. And sure enough, both of them prayed through to the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I had a job the next day. So there's power in proximity, man. Stay close. Goodness gracious. That's powerful. In your season of service, this kind of, to me, flies in the face of the idea that you can just go to a meeting where a man of God's preaching and receive a mantle mm-hmm. or receive something that, uh, I think you can receive a gift. I think you can receive a impartation. But to take on someone's spirit, the prerequisite for that is that season of service and imitation. That's, that's powerful, man. You will never read anywhere in Scripture where someone caught the mantle of a man they did not serve. Mm. So we go to these meetings and we talk about the mantle of T.W. Barnes, the mantle of Merle Ewan, the mantle of Nona Freeman and Billy Cole. You're going to get their mantle tonight. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you did not serve T.W. Barnes, if you were not close in proximity to him, you don't have his mantle. If you did not closely serve Billy Cole, you do not have his mantle. There is no biblical precedent for getting the mantle of a man that you did not serve. Now, I do believe you can do things that attract the anointing that they had. You know, Brother Barnes, it's, it's been said for years that Brother Barnes worked very closely with Michael the Archangel. Now, an individual may not have his mantle, but you can tap into something in the spirit that attracts Michael the Archangel to your life and, and work with him in the spirit. I do believe that. Um, but you don't have the mantle of a man you did not serve. At least that's what the Bible says. <laughs> At least. <laughs> My Lord, that's powerful. That's powerful. So, so during this time of, of service to your pastor, Brother Travis Houston, were you preaching a lot? Very did you, rarely. Did you have a pulpit all the time because of your service? But my my pulpit presence consisted of um, it consisted of Sundays and Wednesdays of doing offering and announcements, and those were some of the most uh, formative moments of learning how to throw out a service schedule and flow in the Holy Ghost. There have been many, many, many times where a service would get carried away and it would reach the point where it was time for announcements, but the Holy Ghost was moving so strong. We're not going to shut that down, you know, just to stick to a service schedule. And so he would, he would trust me to get up there and follow the Holy Ghost. And there'd be many times where I'd, I'd grab the mic and I would just exhort and the gifts of the Spirit would start operating, and uh, you know the choir would never get to the next song, and the Holy Ghost would just move, and that taught me how to flow in the Holy Ghost. And you had that confidence to flow in the Holy Ghost because of your communication and proximity to Him. You right. knew you had that permission and Absolutely. even encouragement to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and well, and plus my my prayer closet. You know, I learned how to flow in the Holy Ghost in the prayer closet, and so because of learning how to flow in the Holy Ghost in my prayer closet that atmosphere was familiar to me in a church service and he trusted me. And you know, if I did some something stupid or if I said something ignorant, you know, he, he was quick to correct me. And when I would preach, he'd call me into his office. You know, if he gave me a if he gave me a Sunday night or a Wednesday night on a rare occasion, 
he'd call me into his office and he'd say, don't do this, don't say that. Uh, this is the mannerism you did. People are going to make fun of you. Don't, you know, I had some weird arm twitch going the first time I preached at my home church. And, and it, you know, he called me in his office and he said, you see this? And, you know, people are going to make fun of you. Don't do that. And this is not how you say that. This is, this is how you say that. And he would critique me and it was, it was very helpful. And so if you have if you have an aversion to constructive criticism and correction, this is not for you. If you don't have a teachable spirit, this is, you know, even today, I, I want to have a teachable spirit. Even today, he corrects me and tells me no. And, and I just have to humble down and submit. You know, one thing about, and this is, this may be getting off topic, I don't know, but I don't believe you get to just choose your pastor. I believe the Holy Ghost chooses your pastor. Amen. And these guys that get elevated and they get connected to people that see this successful state of their life, you know, they, they want to disconnect from the man that saw them in the beginning that's not impressed with who they are today, that knows their flaws, their weaknesses, the chinks in their armor. That's so powerful. They want to disconnect from that man Yes. And cling to the man that sings their praises and lifts mm. them up. And and uh, the next step forward. And, yeah, and, and approves of them all the time. But I can tell you this, you know, God has has really allowed me some awesome experiences in ministry. And he has opened doors that, you know, I I've only dreamed of him opening, you know, youth camps and conventions and conferences and preaching for Brother Joe Campitella. Mm. The greatest achievement. <laughs> the greatest achievement. <laughs> and uh, the greatest effectual door. And um, But my pastor is not impressed with any of that. My pastor cares zero about what platform I stand on. What he cares about is what's your character like? Are you still little in your own sight? Thank you, Jesus. Are you, are you, Lord, are you stewarding your finances? Uh, are you are you are you still submitted to me? Can I still tell you no? Things of that nature, and it still happens today. You know, I've I've gotten phone calls to preach places, and I've thought, uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, there was a conference a few years ago um, that I got a call to to preach at, but they were having an individual preach that had walked away from from some things in the apostolic faith. Why they were having this individual preach, I don't know. But I knew I was going to have to share it. I knew the answer. I knew that I wasn't supposed to go. But really, I, I, I needed an out. I needed my pastor to tell me no. And so I just called him and I said, Pastor, this is who they want me to preach with in this conference. And he said, absolutely not. He said, you're not going he said, because you're going to be associated with that, and that's not what we believe. That's not what we stand for. And and so I I told him, you know, I can't can't make it. And so thank God for a covering. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. Me too. Thank Ooh. you, Jesus. Thank God for a man of God that's not impressed with your successful stage of life. And so, that's such a it's such an important topic because there's a seduction powerful seduction to that to get people that that don't know you but yet you think they can add to you add to your ministry add to your visibility absolutely and your development ceases yeah well and you know i think the misconception is is that my pastor always told me he said if you can't get close to me and handle my flaws don't get close because when you're in proximity, Elisha was so close to Elijah, he was able to see the humanity. And I, you know, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how much you pray, how much you fast, how gifted you are, how revelatory your preaching is, what fruit there is from your ministry when you get done preaching in that altar call. This flesh isn't going anywhere. Still human. There is a human element to every man and woman of God, no matter how great they are no matter how gifted and powerful they are. And so I was close enough to my pastor to see the humanity. 
But what I never did was I never exposed that humanity to anybody. I never, I never talked about any, any, and I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about humanity. I never, I never exposed that. And that's, you, you know, we see that in scripture with, with Noah. Noah had a vineyard and he became drunk from the fruit of that vineyard and his nakedness was exposed in his tent. And there was, there was one son that saw the nakedness of his father and went and told his brethren about the weakness, the humanity of his father. And he was cursed. His descendants were cursed. That's powerful. But there were two sons, Shem and, and Japheth, that they covered their father. And this is what the Bible said. The Bible said that, that because of that, that he enlarged Japheth. Japheth means to be open. And enlarge means to open more, to expand, to open greater. So he was saying, Japheth, you're already great. You're already open. You're already broadened. But because you covered the weakness of the man of God, I'm going to expand you even greater. I'm going to enlarge you even greater. And so there's something powerful to be said when you can be close enough to a man to see his flaws and still choose to submit. And that's, that's priceless. That's priceless. And that's, that's the ultimate test. It's the ultimate test. In my test. opinion. Absolutely. In Elisha, when Elisha is watching Elijah leave the earth, he's not crying out, my ministry, my promised anointing. My father, my father. He's saying, my father. I'm going to miss our relationship. That wasn't, a, that wasn't a cry of jubilation. That wasn't a cry of, of celebration. Now my ministry is starting because mm -hmm. he's gone. Yeah. That was a cry from the heart of a son saying, I'm going to miss the relationship that I have with this man yeah. more than savoring the promised anointing yeah. and spirit that he, that he said. So, wow. Wow. I want to I wanna go back, and I think this is going to be um, more than one session um, I thank God for Brother Caleb Herring because it's uh, there's a tap that just opens up and rivers of living water just flow. And so um, we're just going to keep on talking, but we might do more than one session here. But I want to go back to something you said about your season of service. And, um, you know, it wasn't just your proximity and your communication with your pastor. You said it was your closet. And I want to talk about that closet. I think it's I think it's something that that needs to be heard for young men. I want to know I want to know what men of God who have the favor of God, I want to know what they did. I want to know how they did it. I want to know the map. And so I want to ask you about that closet. How did your prayer life develop? How did your fasting life develop? What was your study time like? What was your what did your consecration look like? So prayer for me has been the most um, the most important thing in my life since I was 15 years old. And you know when I when I quit playing high school ball, man, I showed up that next year to my sophomore year and man, I I gave it up. I quit. I quit ball and then I showed up my junior year and there had been even more changes to my life you know junior year I showed up with long sleeves and you know the preacher haircut I mean I really I sold out and because of those radical changes why long sleeves uh because the Lord convicted me about it in in prayer and probably probably 16 17 years old I was just in prayer and man every time I'd put on and this is just me. I, I know that, uh, you know, this is not something I, I preach behind the pulpit. This is, this is just me. This is not even something my pastor required. This is just Caleb's convictions between me and the Holy Ghost. And I just, I wanted so badly to be different from the world that I just felt like that was one more line to draw. And so probably 16, 17 years old, I've, just been wearing long sleeves. And so 
I, I call it my, that's my camel, my, that's, that's my camel hair and my locust and honey. Not everybody else does it, but that's, that's what I feel God telling me to do. And so I'm, I'm going to stick with it. And uh, man, Louisiana gets hot. So it's not, you know, that's the thing. Convictions aren't always convenient. But you got to go back to what the Lord told you in your prayer closet. And so. Yes, sir. So you went back to school dressed like that. Yeah, I'm getting off topic. Sorry. So I went back to school dressed like that. And man. I love it. We're, we're just following it. My friends, my, my friends, my high school coach uh, cursed me out in front of all of my peers, made fun of Pentecost all of my peers, and, and this is where it hit me just how valuable prayer is, this story that I'm about to tell. All of my friends that were my friends when I was living like the world, playing ball, they turned their back on me. They wanted nothing to do with me. And so I went through a great season of loneliness. No family living for God, no friends in the youth group. It was just you know, I hadn't been around long enough to really develop any friendships in the youth group. It was just me and Jesus. And so I showed up to school and they turned their back on me. And I remember one day, this is where it all really started clicking, the importance of prayer. I went to lunch one day and I've preached this all over. And when I went to lunch, I grabbed my, my lunch tray and I sat it down on the table with all of my, my buddies and a lot of these guys I grew up playing Little League with, so I've known them most of my life at this point. And when my tray hit the table, literally in sync, all of them got up and walked away from the table and left me there because they didn't want anything to do with the Pentecostal preacher boy. And so I just sat there and I, I just finished my meal. And man, when I'm telling you that broke me, because I realized exactly how lonely I truly was. But that day I went home and I'd been praying every day at that point, but this time it was different. I wanted a friend. This time I went home after school and I walked to the back of, of the hallway where my room was. I shut the door behind me and I turned out the lights and I lit a candle. And... um. Whew. I um, I buried my face in a pillow and I just began to weep. And um, I just said, God, I want a friend. Will you just come be my friend? Will you just come talk to me? And for the first time in my life, I felt the manifest presence of God. And I could literally feel him get off of his throne and come wrap his arms around me. And I just, I just wept. And I just said, Jesus, will you please be my friend? And it was that day Jesus became my best friend. And ever since then, I've been trying to become his best friend. And so I would rather pray than preach any day of the week. Because, you know, and I was socially awkward. I didn't know how to make friends. I was very insecure. And a lot of that is the byproduct of of a broken home and not having a, a father figure at the time I needed it most and just not having the affirmation of a, of a male figure. And so, you know, I, I like literally I would, I would go to youth camp or go to conferences and I would be so nervous to be around a crowd that I would have to spend time in prayer before I went to that conference. And the reason is, is because I felt like Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. I felt like I felt like in that prayer closet, God was hiding me. And I would just slip into this place in the spirit where nobody could see me. I felt invisible. I felt cloaked in the presence of God. And when I would show up to that conference or something, I would just feel invisible. There'd be hundreds, thousands of people in that building. But I felt like it was just me and Jesus. And it, and I am so thankful because secret place. And and you know it's it's there's there's a purpose for a wilderness. The purpose for a wilderness is to prepare a man for a mission. And if you bypass the wilderness, the mission will not be as great because the man is not as great. Jesus was led by the Spirit into that wilderness, but he came out walking in the power of the Spirit. Just because you're full of the Holy Ghost doesn't mean 
that you're walking in the power of the Spirit. Jesus went in full of the Holy Ghost, but he came out walking in the power of the Spirit. And the, the link, the, the transitional period was a wilderness. And when you go into that wilderness, you're dying. God's getting things out of you that don't belong. And so I made up my mind, I just want him. And I started, I started fasting. You know, I started off fasting one day. And I remember I did my first three-day fast in high school. And, and, I, and then, you know, I started doing more three-day fast. And, 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 you know, I know there are some people that say, if you tell anybody you've done a long fast, that fast is nullified. It's void. Well, I believe we ought to preach about these fasts. Not, not look at me, look what I did, but... We got to let this next generation know there's a price. There's a this. reason why it's in the Bible there's, to know that Elijah did a 40 day fast. Absolutely. And Moses and Jesus. Jesus did it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I and agree. So, and so, you know, I just, you know, before, you know, I started doing these fasts. And so it would start off. Can I say something right there? Sure. It's, it, to me, it, it's, it's more prideful to put you're fast in an unmentionable category than it is to just bring it down to a level that if God calls you to it, you can do it. Absolutely. It's not mystical. It's not some thing that only an elite, select, special group of people can do. 100%. 100%. And so I started, I started seeing the, the benefits of fasting. And so I would fast you know, my one day a week, and then God would call me to three days. And, and you know, here's the reason. That three I, days a week? Not three days a week, but I'm saying. Three day fast. Three day, periodically, yes, three sir. day fast. Yes, so um, here's the reason that I did this is because my pastor, he would always ask me, how bad do you want it? And I, I determined I refuse to be just another good preacher. I want, I want to open my mouth and something shift in the spirit world. I want to command angels when I go to my prayer closet. I, I want to have an access to that heavenly council that's uncommon. That's not to be better than anybody, but I'm just not satisfied with anything less. And so I started fasting and then it one day would turn into three days and then, you know, I would do a Daniel fast and uh, I don't do the Daniel fast anymore, but at the time I would do a Daniel fast and then I would end with three days of water only. And then I would do another Daniel fast and I'd end with seven days of water only. Um, and I mean, this is in my early teens and twenties and I had a, a, for whatever reason, I had this desire to do a 40-day fast before I turned 30. And then when I started traveling at 23, uh, the Lord called me to a 21-day fast. And I came off of that 21-day fast, and I was preaching in Wichita, Kansas, and I woke up, and an angel was in my bedroom. And that was the first time that an angel had ever visited me. And that didn't happen until... I went on a 21-day fast. And then uh, before my 30th, I just turned 30 uh, back in October. Uh, but two years ago, the Lord called me to my first 40-day fast. And there are two moments in my life where God radically shifted my ministry. And I began to see things and experience things, not just while I was preaching, but even personally, privately, um, that I'd never experienced before. And that was at the end of a 21 day fast and at the end of a 40 day fast. And I, I mean, just crazy things, man. And so, you know, there's a, I stumbled my way into that. And so same thing with studying the scripture. I stumbled my way into, into study. And I, like I told you, I started off with a little pocket. It wasn't even a King James Bible. It was an English standard version. And I had my, my God. Sweet mercy. Yeah. That's almost, yeah, I can't even believe you're apostolic pagan, right now. I know. <laughs> and so, but that was, I started off with that and I just had a little notebook, man. And I've kept those notebooks through the years and I've got stacks and stacks of notebooks that I've filled up since I was 15, 16 years old and uh, thoughts and things the Lord has given me. 
and I just I just stumbled my way through that, and I just started digging and digging and digging, and you know, I would I would study something, and I would I would get a concept and study, and and it would be ingrained in my spirit, and then I would go to prayer after I studied, and in prayer, the Lord would begin to allow me to see that concept through the lens of the spirit. And things would just start clicking and it would get so, and that's a lot of the reason that I, I preach without notes is because I have studied and prayed it into my spirit that it has become a part of who I am. And it, it is, every message I preached is birthed from a place of relationship. Um, I don't study to preach. I don't pray to preach. I study and pray to know him and his ways and understand the workings of the spirit and kingdom principles. And in studying and praying to know him, he gives me stuff to preach. And so I don't even really think that I preach sermons. I think rather I preach kingdom concepts mm. that the Lord's given me to share with the kingdom. And so that flows out of, out of who I am because it's so ingrained in my spirit. And so that's just kind of what led me to yes, sir. where I am today. I think one of those kingdom concepts that you talk about that is, it makes it so crystal clear is sonship. When you talk about sonship, you, you can tell you've been through the process. And I want you to elaborate on the balance. Um, during, during your development years, during the time God was developing your prayer life, did you have a minimum time you wanted to pray? And then I know we've had conversations prior to this about sonship releasing you from a condemnation if you don't meet minimum requirements. Am I, get, am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Pr prayer is not a, it cannot be a performance-based concept. It has to be a relationship-based concept. And so because I did live with that condemnation of, I've got to please my father. I've got to make. I've got to make my father proud. I've got to do this to be accepted by him, because I had a, a skewed perspective of an earthly father. I also had a skewed perspective of my heavenly father, and so it started out as, I've got to pray every day, or I'm not going to be anointed. I've got to pray every day, or, or God's not going to use me to preach. I've got to pray every day or I'm, I'm never going to have revivals. I'm never going to get invitations. I've got to pray every day or I'm never going to have the gifts of the Spirit. I'm never, never going to interact with the angelic. I've got to pray, got to pray. And then I'll be accepted. And then somewhere along the way, God started healing that wound from my childhood and started letting me understand, I love you with a love you cannot even comprehend. And we see that played out in, in uh, the prodigal son. The prodigal son, he wasted all of his inheritance on riotous living. And he was so eaten up with shame and condemnation. When he comes to himself, he says, the hired servants in my father's house have bread enough to eat. I'll go back to my father's house and I'll ask to be a hired servant. He said, I'll go back and be a hired servant, not a son. I'm not worthy to be a son. Well, there's a difference. There, there's a reason that he said a hired servant there and not slave. Because in scripture, there's a difference in a slave and a hired servant. A slave is obligated to serve his master. A slave is bound to serve his master. But a hired servant has to earn his keep around the father's house. A hired servant has to perform. It is performance-based. It is performance-based. Wow. He has to perform well enough to have a seat at the table in the Father's house. And so he said, I'm going to go back and try to perform my way back and to be accepted, being accepted by my Father. And then you, you see the story where he goes back and before he ever even gets to the Father's house, the Father sees him and meets him at his level of vulnerability he doesn't wait for the son to come back home. He runs and he meets him and he falls on his neck and he kisses him. And he never, you never even read in scripture where the prodigal son requested to be back in the form of a hired servant. He never even makes that request. 
He just says, my son was lost and now he's found. My son is back. And watch this. He says, bring him the robe, bring him the shoes, and bring him the ring. That's not talking about a golden ring to put around his finger. That's not talking about jewelry. It's talking about the family signet. It represented the authority of the father. So when the father put that ring back on his son's finger, he was restoring his rights to sonship. So when that son would go make a purchase, he would stamp the signet of the father and it would signify my father has the finances to support this purchase and I am not making this purchase on my authority. I'm making this purchase on my father's authority. Even though I failed, even though I didn't meet all the right requirements, even though I didn't perform well enough, I'm still a son and I'm making this purchase with the authority of my father's name. And so, so whenever we live in condemnation and we don't understand sonship, we'll see somebody who needs the Holy Ghost and the enemy of condemnation will jump in our ear and he'll say, I know what you did this week. You can't pray them through. Or we'll see somebody with a sickness and he'll say, I know what you said. I know what you looked at. I know what you thought. I know what kind of attitude you had. Don't go lay hands on them. You're not worthy to see a miracle. But whenever you go with the authority of your father, you understand it's not me that does the work. It's the father that dwells in me. He does the work. And so now it's at a place of, I don't pray because I feel like I have this quota to meet in order to be anointed behind the pulpit. I pray because I love him. I pray because I want to spend time with him. We view prayer, and that's, that's how I learned how to flow in the Holy Ghost is prayer. I was in a revival a few years ago, and there was this young man that came to me, and I'd been there for probably eight or nine weeks at this point, and he had kind of observed the way that I function and carry myself behind the pulpit. And it was a Sunday morning, and I was getting ready to go up and preach, and he came to me, and he said, Brother Herring, he said, I want to know how do you flow in the Holy Ghost while you preach the way that you flow in the Holy Ghost while you preach? And my answer was very simple. I said, I flow in the Holy Ghost while I preach the same way that I flow in the Holy Ghost while I pray. I know how to flow in the Holy Ghost while I'm preaching because I've learned how to flow in the Holy Ghost while I'm praying. I know the voice of God behind the pulpit because I've learned the voice of God in my prayer closet. I know what angels feel like when they walk into a church service because I have become acquainted with the feeling of angels walking into my prayer closet. And so there is no disconnect from my prayer closet to the pulpit. The pulpit is just an extension of my prayer closet. Yes, sir. There is no disconnect. It's the overflow of, of my prayer closet. And so what happens is, is when we view prayer as a performance-based concept and, and we have this idea of in Pentecost, sweet hour of prayer, if I can just pray 60 minutes early in the morning, I'll mark off this box on my spiritual to-do list and then I'm good for the rest of the day. Well, the problem with that is, is we're acknowledging God for one hour of the day and we're ignoring him for 23 hours of the day. I let the flow determine the clock on the wall rather than allowing the clock on the wall to determine the flow. When the Holy Ghost is done, I'm done. When I feel it lift, I'm done. Whether that's 30 minutes or three hours, when the Holy Ghost is done, I'm done. And then when I get out of that prayer closet, I conduct myself in such a way that I, I, I don't get out of the flow. I live in the flow. I live with a, that's what Paul meant when he said pray without ceasing. He didn't mean shut away in a prayer closet for 24 hours a day. That's impossible. It's humanly impossible. You cannot do it. We have jobs, you have kids, you have uh, spouses, you have obligations that you have, to, you have to tend to. So what Paul was saying was, is when you leave that, that place of alone time with him, don't shut the flow off. Live with a God consciousness and a God awareness. And so literally, you know, it's like I was telling you last night. Can you have one without the other? Can you have 
do you have to have the time of shutting away in addition to that God consciousness flow, or can you just? My answer would be no, because you read all throughout the Gospels where Jesus departed into a place of alone time okay. and prayed. That, to me, is the balance of it. That is the balance Yes, sir. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, it's like I was telling you last night, some of my most, some of my best prayer meetings have, or, or let me say it like this, some of the most clear times the Lord has spoken to me has been in an airport. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll have a delay That's incredible. Or, a, or a long layover. I can't relate to that at all. And, I got to get to that level, man. It's the it's the strangest thing to me. And I'll just, I mean, I'll have my AirPods in listening to worship music and I'll have a delay or a three hour layover. And I'll just, I'll just walk throughout that whole airport and I'll just, I'll just be praying, talking mm. to God under my breath. You know, I'm not making a big show. I'm not, you know, going into warfare and, uh, you know, praying in this demonstrative warfare tongue in the airport. I'm just, I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost, and I'm just talking to God, and that's living Jesus. in the flow. You know, dry, and it, it, it's not even relegated to just that. It's driving down the road in silence. Um, you know, if if I drive to preach somewhere, you know, there's a lot of times I'll drive hours and never even cut on the radio or music, and I'll just be, I'll just be talking to God. I want to ask you on that, are there things you've discovered that are maybe not sin, but they can hinder that flow? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if if you're, you know, it's like I just said, music. Music is not sinful, but if, but if I cut that music on and it's, and it's like things become murky, and the water becomes muddied, or maybe the voice of God starts to get distorted. You know, Jesus talked about how you hear, not what you hear, but how you hear. And so though it may not be sinful, you know, the Holy Ghost doesn't call for music right now, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drive and listen to the voice of God. And then there are other times where, you know, throughout Scripture, the, the minstrel partners with the prophetic and there might be times where I'm not hearing anything, and then I cut some music on that glorifies God, and then boom, it's like the flow is just activated. And so you, you have to find out what, what does the flow demand for that day. There's always a flow. You never have to create a flow or manufacture a flow. You just have to find the flow. And then once you find the flow, uh, you, have to, you have to figure out what does the flow demand today? Do you spend a lot of time in social media and and? Um... I don't have any social media. I have. I don't have Instagram. I don't have. Certainly don't have TikTok. I don't have Twitter or whatever X. I think is what it's called now. Um, Facebook. I don't have any of that. And and part of the reason is um, is because four years ago, twenty twenty the Lord started dealing with me about uh, getting off of it. And, and really, if I'm being honest, part of it had to do with, with, with pride for me because it was getting to the place where, you know, people were wanting me to send in uh, promo videos asking people to come to the conference that I'm preaching. Well, man, that feels more like self-promotion than anything to me. Um, and, and I got, it got to where I was seeing highlight reels of me preaching and people promoting me preaching at a a certain church or whatever. And for, this is just for Caleb, for Caleb's flesh, that was not beneficial. And that was something that I, I just, I didn't want any part of that. I didn't want to give any open door to hear the praises of man or the criticism of man. I wanted that equilibrium and that balance to come from my place of prayer and get that affirmation in my prayer closet, not from social media. And we have turned preachers into celebrities. And we have turned singers and musicians into celebrities. And it's about the highlight reel now. And I really believe that it grieves the Holy Ghost. And what I'm saying right now, there's people that this will probably not make very happy 
but it is a it is a problem that we have created and perpetuated in Pentecost of celebrity preachers. And it's it's the indictment of Saul from the prophet. When you are little in your own sight, you could be trusted with the kingdom. I want to make sure that I I remain little in my own sight. Jesus talked or, or Paul talked about a lowliness of mind. That doesn't mean woe is me, I'm nothing, I'm pitiful. When you study that, it means living with an awareness of your inadequacies. There is a, a healthy uh, awareness that we all have to develop of our weakness and our inadequacy. God's not calling me to be a, a personality. And, and we're, uh, we're kind of, I'm feeling kind of a, to just say this, but, but when you look in the Old Testament, the Bible said that Samuel went in circuit from year to year. Samuel was a prophet. And at that time, the nation of Israel was governed by prophets and judges. And the Bible said that the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. As long as the people receive the prophet, Philistines in Scripture are a type of the flesh. As long as the people receive the prophet, the hand of the Lord was against the flesh. You never read in Scripture after that verse where the Philistines are mentioned until Saul is anointed king. And the reason that the people anointed Saul as king was, watch this, they said, we want a king because every other nation has a king. And so they rejected Saul. They rejected Samuel and anointed Saul. They rejected the prophet and anointed a personality all so they could be like other nations. Our movement is never more like the world than when we replace prophets with personalities. Boy, that's the truth. And when Saul is king, here is the first mention from that verse that said the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The first time the Philistines are mentioned again is when the Bible says, and sore war was made against the Philistines all the days of Saul. So look at the contrast. When the movement was governed by prophets, the hand of the Lord was against the flesh. But when the movement was governed by a personality, there was always contention with the flesh. And so I believe that we're seeing that right now. We're rejecting the Samuels. We're rejecting the Elijahs that preach hard things. That, that say, thus saith the Lord, and preach what we need to hear. And we're elevating personalities and good preaching and sermonizing. And, you know, I was preaching in, I was preaching in, in California uh, in a revival for our, our friend, Brother Jonathan Sanders, last year. And I, I was there for probably 12 weeks, and there was a young man, uh, a young, young prophet, um, he's probably 22, 23. Um, and, and God's really using this young man, especially in Spanish circles. And he came to me and he said, Brother Herring, he said, I, I had a dream. And I think I may have shared this with you already, but it bears repeating. He said, I had a dream. He said, in this dream, I was on a college campus. And he said, the architecture of this college campus, it looked like an Ivy League, like Harvard or Yale. He said it was a very wealthy and a very established university. And he said, I was walking down this hallway at this college, and I was the only person in the hallway. And he said, there was one door open in this hallway. And he said, I walked up to this open door, and above the door, it said, the art of preaching and he said, I walked into this classroom out of curiosity. And he said, this classroom was full of young men and young women that felt the call to preach. And he said, there was a professor standing at the front of this class and he was teaching how to use props and how to use big words and how to come up with crafty, catchy phrases and how to preach things that nobody's ever heard to impress the audience 
And he said, this was the terminology that he was using in the dream was this is how you impress people. This is how you grab people's attention. And he said, in the dream, I got so frustrated that I walked out of the classroom and I went to the library. And he said, Brother Herring, when I walked into the library, you were the only person in the library and you were, you were sitting down at a table and your Bible was open and you were reading. And he said, I came to you and I began to vent my frustration to you about what I just experienced in that classroom. And he said, you stood up from the table and you began to prophesy to me about the next great revival that's coming to North America. And he said, Brother Herring, you weren't prophesying to me about a revival of souls. He said, you were prophesying to me about a revival of true spirit-led preaching coming to this next generation of preachers in North America. And so it's, it's, it. it's we have to get access to that that heavenly council, that divine assembly. And that was the last prayer that Jesus prayed before he ascended into the heavens. He said, let them be one even as we are one. He wasn't saying let them be unified. He was saying let them reach a place of oneness with the Father even as I have reached a place of oneness with the Father. He said, let them be just like you and live with that alignment to you that I have. And that's the way that Job lived. Job was, was considered a prophet. And, and we see that in, in the New Testament, James, he said, let us consider the patience of the prophets. And he listed Job and other prophets to consider. And so Job reached that place of oneness with God. And that is the very thing that put him on heaven's radar and on hell's radar because the Bible said that he feared God, he eschewed evil. He walked up rightly with God and it gave him access to that heavenly council. In Job 1 and 6, it talks about the sons of God gathered together. Well, that is a picture of the heavenly council. That's a picture of the divine assembly often throughout scripture. Uh, we see the heavenly council painted as a courtroom setting. And it is in that divine assembly, that heavenly council, where judicial matters are carried out in the heavenly realm. And Job had access to that. On the earth, he could hear the conversations that were going on in the heavenlies. And it was manifest through his wife who gave these accusations, just curse God and die. Well, she was manifesting the voice of Satan's accusation toward him. And then toward the end of his life, he could hear God's affirmation of him. And God blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Uh, and so when you look at Genesis, you, you see where uh, Genesis, the Garden of Eden was the first template for the heavenly council. Adam had access to that heavenly council. It was unrestricted access to the presence of God. That's why in Job chapter 15, um, Job's friends looked at Job and said, are you the first man born? What they were saying was, are you Adam? And the next verse goes on to say, did you hear the secret counsel of God? That word secret counsel there, one translation calls it confidential conversations. What they were saying was, is are you like Adam? Have you been in that heavenly council? and heard confidential conversations going on in the heavenlies. And so that's why prophets know uh, a lot of times what's going to happen in the earth before anybody else does is because they have an access to that divine assembly, that heavenly council, and they hear conversations going on in the spirit world that not everybody else hears. And so here's the importance of not rejecting prophets and elevating personalities is God had something pretty strong to say about men that run without a message and don't spend time in his heavenly council. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and he said, these false prophets, he said, had they stood in my council, they would have turned your hearts from your wicked ways. But because they did not stand in my council, 
they preached the imaginations of their hearts. In other words, because they didn't spend time in my counsel and hear what the Spirit truly has to say about the kingdom and about the movement, they preach what gets them uh, they preach what gets them influence with man rather than what gets them influence with God. And that's very dangerous. I'm not interested in preaching what gets me invited back or what gets me an invitation to another place. I have a mandate from heaven. What's the Holy Ghost saying? What secret conversations have I heard going on in that heavenly council that I've got to relay to the world? Wow, that the prophecy of that young man that there will be a revival of spirit-led preaching to me fits into the paradigm of the coming of Jesus Christ. You know, before the coming of Jesus Christ, the forerunner, he wasn't focused on reaping a harvest. He wasn't focusing on miracles. He was focusing on realigning the people with God's way. Absolutely. Repent. Yep. And um, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a spirit-led focus of a re- you better realign. Absolutely. Trumpet's about to sound. Well, it's, it's all about alignment. And that's, that is the role of the, the prophetic office is aligning the body with the head, which is Jesus Christ. So when you, when you look in the Old Testament, you see that you see the Shunammite woman who built a room for the prophet and the prophet comes, and because she built a room for the prophet, he says, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. What he was saying was, is he was looking at the bride, and he was saying, because you made room for the prophet, a year from now, your future is going to be manifest. And so this this bride, she births that promise. She has this son, and then... As the story goes, he falls and he hits his head and he dies. Well, what does the bride do? She takes her future and she puts it in the room that she built for the prophet. And the prophet comes in and shuts the door and he lays on top of the bride's future. And he aligns the boy's eyes with his eyes and the boy's mouth was hit with his mouth and the boy's hands with his hands. And he came back to life. When the bride aligns its future with the prophetic office, we'll see what God sees. We'll hear what God hears. We'll say what God says. We'll do what God does. The prophetic office aligns the bride's future with what God sees, with what God says, and with what God does. And when we do that, there will be a revival in the future of the apostolic church like never before. We got to make. I we, believe that we got to make room for. We got to stop. We got to stop muzzling God's men. Cancel culture in Pentecost. It's, it's, it's a detriment. We're we're, we're canceling preachers because they're not. You know, I, I, I just, anyway, we're just. We need a revival of true spirit led preaching in Pentecost, but not just a revival of spirit led preaching. We need a revival of receiving true spirit-led preaching. So, wow. I want to I go back to something you said um, about sonship. And um, you talked about the revelation of sonship that Jesus gave you that released you from condemnation and caused you to base your prayer on relationship rather than performance. Is... Is that a one and done thing? Or do you find yourself, do you find old wounds ever trying to reemerge? Do you ever find that you have to continually reestablish that revelation? And- Absolutely. It, for me, it was not a one and done. And I don't, I really don't believe that for anybody. It's a one and done. Um, every, every now and then, I'll go through something where it's like the scab is kind of peeled off. And, and I've got to go to my prayer closet and I've got to let the Lord really minister to me and put some salve on the wound. And you know, God's been so kind to me. There have been many God moments in my life where the Lord has reminded me how much he loves me. 
you know, it was uh, it was the end of 2020, and I was really in a place where I just felt so forgotten by God. Even though God was using me, and I was full time in ministry, full-time traveling in the ministry, world, forgotten by God, traveling all. I mean, coast to coast, man, busy. Fifty-two weekends out of the year, and just I mean, so busy that I'm almost begging for a break. But it, it was such a gaping wound in my life that even that didn't didn't satisfy it. Um, and I was I was on my way to a man one of the one of the most memorable revivals things that I saw God do that I've ever ever been a part of. Even in the middle of that still feeling like I'm just worthless and forgotten. And I was driving to this place and I just said, God, and, and this is how much he loves us. He said, God, I, I said, God, if you know where I am and you haven't forgotten me and all these things you've promised me, you're, you're, you're really going to do them. I need you to please just let me know please, God. I mean, I was begging him, please, God, just remind me that you've got me and you know where I'm at. And that morning, that that next morning, that was Saturday, the next morning, Sunday morning, I'm standing around the altar and I'm my eyes are closed and I'm praying. And this gray-headed elder prophetess in this church never met this woman in my life. She comes to me and she, she gets in my ear while I'm standing there with my eyes closed praying. And she goes, thus saith the Lord, you are my son and every step you will ever take is ordered by me. I know exactly where you are and I love you with a love you cannot even comprehend. Don't tell me God doesn't love me. I, I Now it's to the point, I really believe I'm, I'm God's favorite. And I know you feel you're like you're God's favorite. And anybody who has the revelation of sonship feels like they're, they're God's favorite. I really believe that I am God's favorite. It's interesting, you know, with, um, this is a analogy, hopefully you'll be able to use one day, but with four children, they want to know who's, daddy's favorite Mm -hmm. and so anytime i'm alone with the child on a trip or whatever i will tell them i just want you to know you're my favorite i love it and then they got the somehow the secret got out that i tell all of them that they're my favorite but that's that's a powerful revelation because once you get to that that special place with your father you do hear him say you are my favorite yeah because he's got enough favorite to go around. He you know? does. It's Man, an unlimited, unlimited supply. And you know, there, there's there been, I'll tell you one of the, one of the most pivotal moments in my life where God healed me. I had, uh, it was two years ago, I had just come off of that, my first 40 day fast. And so I was in a, uh, man, my flesh was just dead. I was just open to whatever God wanted to do in me. And I went to a meeting in Annapolis, Maryland. And um, as I said earlier, my parents divorced when I was 12 years old. And that's kind of when when it all started for me. Uh, the, the, the pain, the trauma, the damage, the wounds, the abandonment, things of that nature. And I went to this meeting and someone got up behind the pulpit. They weren't even, they weren't even speaking that that night and he got up behind the pulpit and he said he said before we move any further and this is how much God I'm telling you I really believe I'm God's favorite and this is part of the reason why this is how specific God is he gets up and he says he says we're not going to move any further because the Lord spoke to me and said that there are some of you in this room that God wants to pour into but because there are wounds and things that have happened in your life that you've not let him heal, he cannot trust you with it because it will leak out through those wounds. And, you know, I thought, oh, man, I'm healed. I'm good. That's, that's not me. And I, I really tried to kind of 
even though I was in a vulnerable, broken place and my flesh was dead, I just, I, I really thought that I was, I was good. I was healed. And so anyway, he prays and, you know, God's working and people all over. Then he comes back to the pulpit. And, and this is how specifically God was reaching for me in that moment. He said, the Lord just made it more clear, made it more specific. He said, the Lord spoke to me and said, you were 12 years old when it happened. And right then I knew, okay, God, there's still some things you want to heal in me. And when I'm telling you, I went to that altar and I laid there on my face and I wept more bitterly and, and more violently than I ever had. It was like, it was like years and years and years and years of things I had never let out came out all in one moment. And, and it wasn't a one and done but it's like that was the surgery and everything after that is just kind of rehab. You've just kind of re got to revisit the old wound. Wow, what a great way to put it. And, and you know, make sure that the, the heart is still pumping right after the heart surgery and make sure that the, the limb still has mobility after the tendon's been put back together, if that makes sense. And man, I'm, I'm telling you, God just, God really did a work in that moment. And so ever since then, God's just had little gentle reminders of, of you know, letting me know, I know where you are. I got you. You're, you're good. Yes, sir. So. If, if, you could, if you could define a, a path to that spot, if you could define a, some keys for, because it's not just for boys, men, it's for women. Absolutely. What what would be some what would be the keys to get to that place where God is showing you sonship? Um, for me, it, it really does all boil down to prayer. Time spent with God. Time spent with God, because pro, there, it's not just power in proximity to your your spiritual father, as in your pastor. It's there's power in proximity to your heavenly father. The closer I get to him, the more appropriately I see him. Therefore, the more appropriately I see myself. And I don't look through, I don't look at myself through the lens of this damaged little boy that's without a father. Now I can look at myself through the lens of I've got a father that's so proud of me and he loves me. But had I never been in proximity to him, I wouldn't have had that. The best classroom is the prayer room. <laughs> and there are so many things that you learn about the spirit world just by simply going to prayer. And God has taught me so many things, primarily how to view myself. But I wouldn't have that without proximity to him. So the best way, and you know, there, because you have proximity to him, there are byproducts of that. You know, it was, it was my proximity to him and just begging him, saying, God, let me know. Let me know you've got me. Well, that happened in an alone moment with him. The byproduct of that was God sending a prophetess to tell me, he loves you, he's got you, every step you take is ordered by him. And so if you can just get in proximity to him in your prayer closet, God will order your steps to meet the people you're supposed to meet to help you with this. Yes, sir. And to be in the service to hear the message preached that you need to hear preached and to sit at the table you need to sit. And that's, you know, that's a, a we haven't talked about this, but, you know, God has been so kind to me. And we talked about those giftings that I had since I was a kid that I didn't understand God has been so kind to me in connecting me with men to help me understand those things. But not just understand those things. These men have helped me understand God loves me. I'm not damaged goods. I, I'm, he is proud of me. I am pleasing him in my life. And, and God's got me. And so God's been so kind in that regard. But that's all a byproduct of getting along with him 
And if you can do that, God's going to take care of the rest. God, either the steps of a good man are ordered by God or they're not. And scripture says they are. And you have to rest in that. God's going to put you where you need to be, when you need to be there, in the service, in the right altar call, at the right table, next to the right person to heal you. It's, it's going to happen. Wow. I tell you, from my perspective, Brother Caleb, sonship is the crux of the whole matter. It's the foundation of all, all other revelation and building that God can do in your life. That's, that's going to help so many people, man. I'm, I'm receiving answers right now. And, uh, Thank you, Jesus. And clarity. And I know, I know everybody listening will as well. Jesus name. I want to ask you one more thing unless you want to get into other things. I'm I'm totally good with that. Depends on I what feel you're like about you're to ask me. <laughs> I feel like you're laying out a buffet really of of just the highest level, highest quality spiritual meat we can partake of. And I, I truly thank God for you. And I'm humbled. I'm humbled to be in this in this moment. Loneliness. Mm -hmm. You're a single man and um you're 30 years old, just turned 30 years old. What, what role has loneliness played? What challenge has loneliness presented? And uh, just, just elaborate on that if you can. I've said this many times throughout my ministry, but loneliness has been the greatest gift that God has ever given me because my greatest source of pain has become my greatest source of power. And if I would have had them, I wouldn't have had him. If, if I would have been in a situation in my earlier years where I was the guy at camp meeting that everybody wanted to go eat with, and I'm still not to this day, or the guy at general conference that everybody was slapping on the back, saying, man, let's get something to eat after church. I'm still not that guy to this day, and I thank God for it. Because if I would have had them... I wouldn't have had him. And I, I preach a message, and it's called Leave Me Alone. And I take my text from Genesis 32, where the Bible says that uh, Jacob was left alone. And I really believe that if Jacob had not been alone in that moment, somebody would have interfered with a God moment that was meant to change the trajectory of his life. And so we have to get to the place where we, we look at things or people and we say, leave me alone. And so uh, I had someone ask me one time, what is the difference between loneliness and isolation? The difference between loneliness and isolation is isolation is caused by sin, but loneliness is caused by the Spirit. When man fell in the garden, that is great. they were in perfect relationship and communion with God. And then when they fell in the garden, the first thing that they did was when the voice of God came walking in the cool of the day, seeking relationship with them, they hid themselves from the voice of God. And God said, Adam, Eve, where are you? And so that isolation was caused by sin. So don't come to me and say, Brother Herring, I'm so lonely, when really you're just entertaining sin behind closed doors and people are inviting you and they've got to, it's like pulling teeth to get you to come to youth night and people are trying to hang out with you, but you, know, you, just, you just want to do your own thing. You're not lonely. You're isolating yourself. That's not God. That's sin. That's condemnation. That's shame causing that. What you need to do is you need to go to church, get delivered, Repent of your sins. Let God forgive you and, and get back into fellowship with the body of Christ. But when you're lonely, it doesn't matter what effort you make to fit in, there's going to be a rejection. And you're, you're, no matter how hard you try, you're, man, when I was a teenager and in, even in my early 20s, when it came time to meet somebody new, man, my hands would get clammy. My brow would start sweating because I was just so nervous to meet people, so introverted. And God's really helped me with that because of the nature of what I do. I have to be around people. 
And so God's taught me how to be an extrovert um, to a degree. But isolation is caused by sin. Loneliness is caused by the Spirit. Because the Bible said that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. And Jesus departed into a mountain to pray. And when you look, I think it's in Mark chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus was standing on a boat addressing a great multitude. That word multitude there, um, when you study it, it translates to mean the greatest crowd. So apparently this was the largest crowd that Jesus had ever addressed in his ministry. But a few verses later, it says that Jesus was alone. And in the same verse, he had already departed from the crowd. And it said Jesus was alone. But in the same verse, it says, and the 12 that were with him. Well, that's a paradox. How can Scripture say Jesus was alone, but there were still 12 other people with him? It's because there is a difference in there there is a, a different level that you reach where you transition from being so close to him that it's not just I'm alone with Jesus, but now it's Jesus is alone with me. Those disciples were so close to him and had followed him so closely that they weren't just alone with Jesus. Jesus felt so comfortable and so close with them that now Jesus was alone with them. And so that is, that is the goal and the desire that I have in my life is I want to be so close to him that Jesus feels like he's alone with me and that I'm a friend that, that he can talk to. And the Bible says the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. That is a level that goes far beyond just uh, being a preacher, being a prophet, or, or whatever. You only get that from loneliness. The Bible says that, um, the Bible says that the Lord hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. He said, Moses, there is a place by me. And I have found that a place by God is usually a place away from everybody else. He said, Moses, there's a place by me. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to put you in a place and in a position where I am the only person who knows where you are. Nobody else, you're going to be shut off from the public eye and I'm going to hide you. And he said, there is a place by me. That word place there, it means a location or a position. So loneliness is not a limitation. Loneliness is a location. Loneliness is not a condition. Loneliness is a position. It is a spot in the spirit that has been ordained by God for this season of your life. And whenever you're in a true God-ordained season of loneliness, you can be the only, you can be in a room full of other people, whether it's 10, whether it's 100, whether it's 1,000 or 10,000, or at North American Youth Congress, with 30,000, when you're in a God-ordained season of loneliness, because I think often I've had people say, Brother Herring, I feel lonely, but I have so many people around me. Loneliness is often an emotion, not a reality. It's an emotion that God evokes in you, not a reality that he surrounds you with. Elijah said, I'm the only one left, but God said, no, that's just the emotion you feel. The reality is there are 7,000 others that are just like you. But because I want to talk to you, Elijah, I had to let you feel lonely. In order for me to do what I truly want to do in you and through you, I can't expose you to the 7,000 just yet. I've got to have you in this season where it's just me and you. And until you yield to that and lean into that, you can be in a room full of hundreds and thousands of other people and feel like you're the only one in the room. It's because he wants to talk to you. He wants you to tell some things, leave me alone. And he wants you to wrestle with him until the breaking of the day. 
And so loneliness is often an emotion, not a reality. And it's just the call to prayer that you're feeling. And until you yield to that, you're, you're going to feel that emotion and, until finally. And now when I really feel God calling me away to prayer, he evokes that emotion of loneliness in me. When I feel all alone, I know God's calling me away to a specific season of prayer. And I've got to tell some things, leave me alone. That's powerful, man. I think one of the more surprising things I faced with marriage because I had a season of loneliness Um, got married at 32 and I had it in my mind that marriage was the kind of the final fix all for loneliness Mm -hmm. but God still evokes that feeling even surrounded with the most intimate companionship God will still put that on you and call you well and a lot of that has to do with with the prophetic ministry that the Lord has placed on your life. I was, um, I was in a revival. Um, I think it was, it was the last, last year, um, around summertime of last year. And I was just, I was just in this season of loneliness and I just, I just felt so alone. And I went and preached for this man, dear friend of mine. And, I was standing on the platform and I had my hands lifted and I think it was like the last song before I was to go up and preach and this pastor came to me and he leaned over and he said, the Lord just gave me a vision for you. He said, I saw you driving down the road in a vehicle and he said, there was a man in the passenger seat And he said, as you're driving down the road, all of a sudden you reach over and you open the passenger door and you begin to try to push the man in the passenger seat out of the door as the vehicle is moving down the road. And he said, as you were pushing him and trying to force him out of the door, out of the vehicle, he said, the man's face turned and looked at you. And across the man's forehead was written the word loneliness. He said, the Lord told me to tell you that you will never fully escape loneliness because prophets are meant to be lonely people. And man, that liberated me so much. I gave up the fight at that point. And it was always something that I leaned into, but I realized that this is something that I'm going to to have as a part of my life and ministry until the day that I die. As a gift. As a, as a gift. It, is, it has been the greatest gift of my life. And, and that's just God letting me know, when you feel this, that is a spiritual marker. That is a spiritual indicator that I have some things that I want to share with you. Come talk to me for a while. That's powerful. God's so good. God's good. He's good. When I, when I started fallen head over heels in love with Jessica and we began to court and then got engaged. I, I can remember the awkwardness of God let me go through a season where the loneliness dissipated mm-hmm. and it was a very uncomfortable, it was new territory because loneliness had been my companion. You felt backslid. I felt backslid. That's yeah. exactly right. And I'm like, is this even legal? You know, am I am I living a, a but God was God was allowing that to ease up for a while to enjoy the fullness of that. And then in his timing it would come back. And my goodness, man, what a well, you're helping me right now. Hey, God is good. God knows. Praise God. God knows. <laughs> I love you, Brother Herring. I love you, my friend. I thank you so much for your time. I thank you for the the flow that you've bought, that you've purchased. And um, I I believe this is going to help a lot of people. Thank you for joining us on Christian Live Broadcast. Um, We pray and hope that this is a blessing to you and believe it will be in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you, and we'll see you next time.